In this screencast, we're going to learn a bit about singular value decomposition, really using singular value decomposition, because the routines for doing it are implemented for us in our currently favorite module, SciPy all Nails, which we'll import in the usual way. Again, looking at the documentation, we can see a couple of, uh, or a few things now that are useful for us. This pseudo inverse we've talked about. Notice there's a few routines for handling it. Uh, the first two uh, just use different algorithms. The one that we've talked about is the pseudo inverse using singular value decomposition. There's a relationship between this and, and this is least squares method. Uh, it doesn't really matter for us which one we use. We're going to use the singular value decomposition because it's actually a little faster. There's a specialized routine for Hermitian matrices. Hermitian is uh, for complex matrices. The equivalent for us when we just deal with real values is symmetric matrices. Okay, we've seen that in the context of eigenvalues, for example. Okay. Uh, so we're not going to worry too much about that, uh, but we'll play a little bit with the pseudo inverse. For calculating the actual singular value decomposition, there's a routine for that, SVD. Okay, so we'll be using this. There's a few specialized routines also for just getting the singular values, for constructing the diagonal matrix of the singular values, for just getting the what we call the U matrix. Again, these are useful routines uh, in special cases if we just want the singular values, etc. Uh, but for us, we're just going to focus on SVD, and you can look at the other ones yourself. Okay, so uh, let's start by constructing some random matrix. We're going to use a 4 by 4 matrix, so we'll still be using square matrices. Uh, one that we can play with. Now if we just construct a random matrix and look at some of its properties, we see that it's going to be reasonably well behaved. It has a non-zero determinant, okay, slightly small but not horribly small. Okay. It has eigenvalues okay, listed here that are reasonable. This one turns out to all be real, which is a little surprising, but has reasonable um, eigenvalues. So we could do a singular value decomposition of this, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it doesn't explore, you know, we don't get to use the full power of singular value decomposition, or at least what makes it special, if we have a matrix that can be processed in other ways uh, equally well. So let's make our matrix singular. Okay, not invertible, by taking linear combinations of a couple of the rows. So here I've replaced the first row with a particular linear combination, and I'm going to replace the last row with a particular linear combination. There's nothing special about these choices. They're just linear combinations that are easy to write. I could have used random numbers, uh, but it's just easier this way, particularly for things we're going to do in a little bit. Now if we look at this matrix, calculate its determinant, we see yes, that is pretty darn close to zero. If we look at its eigenvalues, we now see that its eigenvalues, there's two of them which are pretty much zero. And so that's what causes uh, problems for us as we've seen in the past. So to deal with this matrix, it's useful to do a singular value decomposition. So let's look at what this does for us. So as usual, there's a whole bunch of options, but really we can use it in its simplest form as just pass in the matrix A. Okay? As noted here, this does not need to be a square matrix, unlike in many cases. Okay, we happen to be using a square matrix, but we don't have to. Okay? The full matrices is then useful if we weren't passing in a square matrix, because then it would determine the, the shapes of U and, and V. Um, whether they're square or not. Uh, for us, they're going to be square. And then, again, other options for optimizing uh, things. As this notes, this calculates the singular value. They're going to be real and not negative, such that we can write A in this form, U, S, and here they write it as VH. Again, we wrote, called this V transpose because we're just dealing with real matrices, whereas this Decomposition can, of course, also be used on complex matrices. So we'll continue to call that V transpose instead of, uh, well, V adjoint or V dagger or whatever, if you're familiar with Hermitian conjugates. <coughs> okay. So again, it returns U, S, and what we're going to call V transpose. 
And again, the shapes of these and other things are going to depend on options that we've made. But just using the, de the default options, this is going to return us and v transpose for us. So we can calculate that for our matrix. Okay, and there it is, u, s, and v transpose. Okay. It's useful to store these in something, so let's give them names. I like to call them exactly what they are, u, s, and v transpose, so I call that vt. Okay. We start by looking at the singular values. Again, the singular values are real, they're positive, and by default this sorts them from the largest to the smallest. We notice there's two very small singular values. These are essentially or equivalent to zero. Okay, numerically they are zero because this is the, the limit of the precision. And so that's what causes problems for us. We also get these nice matrices that we can do things with. So the first thing that we've talked about doing with a singular value decomposition is this thing called the pseudo-inverse. Now we know this matrix A is not invertible. It's not actually invertible. We can try to calculate its inverse. There we go. And numerically, the routine's happy to do that for us. And it gives this silly looking result. And notice all of these are of order 10 to the 16. Whereas we started with a matrix with values of order 1. So it's kind of funny that its inverse would be such large numbers. In fact, we know that it's not, or that we can't calculate an inverse. And so numerically, this is just coming about from our lack of precision, Okay, that we're inverting very small numbers and getting very large numbers. We can see that when we, when we do the pseudo-inverse, because to do the pseudo-inverse, we need to calculate the inverse of our u, s, and v transpose. u and v transpose are easy to invert because they're orthogonal matrices, and S we can easily invert, invert because it's a diagonal matrix. So we just take one over it. When we do that, we see that we get reasonable answers for the first two, but the last two are just huge numbers which come about because we have these very small singular values. We said for calculating the pseudo-inverse, what we want to do is we want to replace these very large values with the ones that come from the very small singular values with zero. We can do that in a number of ways. Okay? And uh, this one obvious thing that we can do is use the where command, which is now one of our favorite commands. We can actually do that in a sh sh more shorthand way. Uh, we don't actually have to use where, and we'll see this a bit in the lab this week, uh, that we can also just leave out where and look for where is s less than some value. Let me use s. 10 to the minus 13. And so this, leaving out the where, does exactly the same thing. Where returns the list of indices. This returns a Boolean array. And again, we'll see examples of that in the lab. In the end, this does the, the right thing, or the same thing, sets these values equal to 0. With that, we can now calculate something that we'll call A inverse. Again, remember, this is not a real inverse, and we'll see that more explicitly in a second. We calculate this as V transpose inverse. Well, V transpose inverse is it's transpose, so V transpose transpose. <coughs> okay, since it's an orthogonal matrix, we multiply that by the matrix that we get from S inverse. Okay, so we make that turn that diagonal that vector into a diagonal matrix. And U inverse, which is U transpose. The A inverse we get has reasonable looking values in it. Okay, they're not huge like we saw before. But this really isn't a very good inverse. Okay? A, A inverse should be the identity matrix. It's not. Okay, it's not even really that close to the identity matrix. Okay? That's because this is a pseudo inverse. We've thrown away information, and so we can't fully reconstruct this. Okay? That's the price we pay. Okay, we can calculate something that behaves like an inverse, but without all the information. Okay. So again, that's a use for this. Why would we calculate, want to calculate a pseudo-inverse? Well, there's various reasons why we might want to do this. We're not going to explore those cases in detail. It's just something that we can do. We calculated this using the singular value decomposition. And as we said, there's a routine that does this for this. It computes, computes. Uh, what's called the Moore-Penrose, or pseudo-inverse, of a matrix. And PN2 uses the singular value decomposition. 
Okay? We feed it a matrix A. We can feed it conditions. Notice we had to decide wh what's the smallest singular values we're going to allow. That's what these do. Conditioned is an absolute value. We used 10 to the minus 13 in our previous case. Our cond is a relative compared to the largest singular value. We can also have it do other things. We can, for example, have it return the rank of the matrix. We call it, we said in class, the rank of, of, the, matri of the matrix is the number of non-zero singular values. Okay, so the answer here should be 2. So let's use this routine. And let's have it return the rank just so we can see it. Okay, we don't need to do that, but we might as well. Here's the pseudo inverse that we've calculated, and the rank is 2, exactly as we expect. We forced two of the rows to be linear combinations, the other two aren't, so the rank is 2. If we compare this pseudo inverse to the one that we've calculated here, we get exactly the same answer, and we should because we've used the same technique. Okay, <clears throat> um, that was a lot on pseudo inverse. The other good use for this is calculating solutions to systems of equations when we have too few equations. So we've constructed this matrix A, which now we know is not all linearly independent. So if we construct a system of equations, this will only end up being two equations for two unknowns. So let's calculate our matrix B, we want to, or vector B. We want to solve AX equals B. To make sure that we have a consistent set of equations, we need to do the same transformations to B as we did uh, on A. Okay, if we don't do this, then we won't have a consistent set of equations, and there won't actually be a solution. So if we do the same transformation, now the first and last equations really are linear combinations of the other two equations, and we can find a solution. We can ask solve to find a solution for us, and it happily finds a solution. Okay. But there's no guarantee that this is a unique solution. It just returns one. But in fact, we know that there's not a unique solution. Okay. So it finds a solution, which is nice. We can even verify that this is a solution. But it's not the unique solution. What we can do with the singular value decomposition is find the general solution. Okay, so we've briefly discussed this in class, and we're going to do a further discussion on Wednesday. Um, and so some of this will make a bit more sense after we've gone through those uh, details. In particular, we're going to write down explicit forms uh, for this, or write them down again and see how they're all related. So this discussion from here on will make a little more sense after we've done that in class on Wednesday. What that means is you should listen to this and watch this again, notice I said again, uh, after we've discussed this on Wednesday so that things make more sense. Or at least we can see how things uh, work out. Okay, so the basic idea is, is that when well, we've already discussed this is we can do use the singular value decomposition to transform our equations. When we transform these, th these equations, what we end up with is we end up transforming the right-hand side of our equation using U transpose. Okay, we'll call that B prime. Okay. <coughs> we can solve for a, our particular solution to our equations. We'll call that XP. And that's given by dotting V, otherwise known as V transpose transpose, into S inverse times B prime. So the claim is that this is a particular solution to our equations, to our system of equations. Okay. Notice that this solution is different than the one that Solve gave us. Okay. That isn't necessarily a problem. Solve is finding a solution. Okay. This is finding a different solution. Now we know that the solution is not unique, so it's not surprising that these don't give the same answer. There's no reason why they should. We can verify that this is a solution by dotting this into x. Uh, sorry, dotting, uh, multiplying A by XP. Okay, this should return B, and what do you know it does? In fact, let's check that more carefully. And so we see, to within numerical precision, this is a valid solution. Now we know that this is not a unique solution. We know that there's null vectors. Okay. In fact, there's a null vector for every one of the singular values that's a zero, and in this case there's two of them that are very small that we're calling zero. 
So there should be two null vectors. These null vectors are stored in the transpose in the appropriate rows. So these are pr stored in the rows where, well, the singular values are zero. In this case, it's the last two. Using array slicing, we can easily get the last two rows from VT. Now, for things that we're going to do following, it's simpler, but it's more convenient to, to take the transpose of this. That is, instead of looking at these as the, the, the null vectors as rows, make the null vectors columns. And so let's call that Z. Okay, so each one of these columns is a null vector. What does that mean? Well, that means that if we multiply A by these vectors, take the dot product, or use dot, uh, we should get zero, zero vectors. Okay, well, we do. Okay, so each one of these vectors that we started with, multiplied by A, gives me zero. So these are, in fact, null vectors. What that means now is that we have the general solution. Whoops. <coughs> Here's a particular solution, and now we can take any number times this null vector plus any number, potentially different number, times this null vector, and that will also be a solution. Okay. So let's pick some random numbers. Let's call them alpha. Okay, so we have two random numbers. If we take alpha times z, okay, this does the right thing. Okay, so we multiply this two component thing by this, well, by this. Uh, 4 by 2 thing. Okay. Th this does the right thing. It's known as broadcasting. Okay. In this case, what this does is it multiplies this number, the first number, by this column. In other words, it multiplies the first uh, uh, column of each row by this number, and it multiplies the second column of each row by this number. Okay. So that's exactly what we want. <coughs> To, to construct a solution, then, we want to sum these. Well, we can sum them, but that doesn't do the right thing. Sum sums up everything. What we want to do is we want to just sum the columns, not the rows. Well, if you look at the documentation for sum, you'll see that there's something called axis. And we can tell it which axis to sum over. Okay, by default, it sums over all axes. This is a two-dimensional thing. Okay, axis 0 are the rows. Axis 1 are the columns. So we can tell this to sum over the columns. And if we do that, it returns a vector, okay, or a single dimensional thing that has four elements in it. And so with that, we can construct now a general solution, which is our particular solution plus this linear combination of the two null vectors. And the claim is, is that this is also a solution. So XP we know is a solution. Okay. We know that if we use solve, that gives us a solution. Well, here we claim is another solution. We can verify that that's also a solution by multiplying it out and seeing we get 0. Okay. We can construct a different alpha. Okay. This will construct a different solution for us. Okay. So here's another solution that's different than the previous one different than XP. Verify that it's a solution. We can repeat this ad nauseum. Okay, so we can construct lots and lots of solutions, or at least verify that lots and lots of things are solutions. Okay, but now we, again, know what the general solution is. It's our particular one plus any number times each one of the columns, uh, or, sorry, each one of the null vectors. Okay, and just add all those up, and that gives us our general solution. Okay. And so this is how we use the singular value decomposition to find such solutions. Okay, there's a few other things that can be done with this. We can work with non-square matrices, as we saw in the documentation. And again, in the lab on Friday, we will play with some other aspect of this, where we can model matrices in much simpler ways uh, by truncating them uh, using singular values, and we'll see an example of that.